to work Suddenly I'm not afraid Cause you speak and Freedom reigns There is hope Every single word you say I don't want to miss one word you speak Cause everything you say is life to me I don't want to miss one word you speak Why in my heart I'm listening because we he lives amen
Amen. Amen. Sounds like you all know the world's future. Yep. <laughs> and you have a reason to keep living. Uh, yes, Easter season may be done, but it's never really done. We're celebrating the resurrected Jesus. Amen. Um, awesome. Well, so good to uh, see you this morning. Happy Mother's Day again, as we have said, and we're glad that you are here today. Some of you uh, maybe are not regularly here on Sunday morning, uh, but you're here because your mom or a mother figure got you here this morning, and so I'm grateful for that, and uh, I just hope and pray that God's going to work in your hearts this morning. Uh, before I dismiss the children, actually, uh, as I'm dismissing the children, we're thinking about uh, the resurrection, and, I, and I, last week I shared with you that uh, a church member, Donna Farrell, went home to be with the Lord. Uh, some of you know this as well, um, but Kay Bazell also went home to be with the Lord uh, this last week. And so some of you know that, some of you don't. Uh, someone who was a member here for many, many years um, and uh, just served the church in, in an incredible way, served the Lord in a great way. And I don't have details on a service and such for her yet, but when I do, I will let you know. So, um, I don't know. Did I say children ages three to five? Welcome to go to children's church. Did I say that already? All right. No? If I didn't, they can go. If not, well. Um, and as, as you're opening your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, a few things. Uh, next week, we're going to have another baptism. If you'd like to be baptized because you haven't been baptized yet, uh, we'd love to do that next week. Let myself or one of the other pastors know. Um, then also... Um, on Saturday this week, we're going to have a work day for church. If you'd like to come, and, uh, or if you don't want to come but you're free, you should come anyway. And we're going to have some specific projects that we need done. Um, starting at 8 until probably noon or so, we'll probably get you some, well, we'll get you some lunch if you stay until then. And so come uh, talk to myself or one of the other pastors about some of the projects that will need to be done. But pretty much, regardless of your age or your ability level physically, we'll have some stuff that you can, uh, that you can do to help. Um, and then as, the, as you're leaving today, we have a gift for you, all of you ladies, uh, for Mother's Day, regardless of if you have children of your own or you are a mother figure to somebody else, uh, on your way out today, uh, we have a gift for, for you. So just keep an eye out for that. Let's pray, and then we'll spend some time in God's Word. Uh, dear Jesus, we come before you. We thank you that you are alive and well. We praise you for that. And even as we spent time the last few weeks uh, just focusing in on the power of the resurrection, the power of our ability to come before you and confess our sins before you, a living God, and be able to approach your throne with boldness and confidence because of the cross, we thank you and we praise you for that. We thank you that because you have risen from the dead, you've showed us that, shown us that our sin may be powerful, but you are more powerful than that. And because of that, we can experience freedom and life in you. And as we spend time in your word this morning, uh, Jesus, just guide us, uh, work in our hearts the things that I say would be from you, glorifying, uh, glorifying to you, and uh, just from your, your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been going through a series uh, through 1 Corinthians. We spent the last few weeks in chapter 15 because of uh, Easter and celebrating the resurrection. We're going to go back to chapter 7 today and spend some time in the, on the subject of marriage and then next week on singleness. Um, and so chapter 7 verses 1 through 16 is where we'll spend the bulk of our time this, this morning. So flip in your Bibles if you haven't already done so. Chapter 7 or on your screens or wherever you are um, and We'll, we'll spend some time and see what God has for us there. We're going to be, as you see in your outline there, some different points there, some different verses. We'll read through them as we get to them. But we start off talking about marriage. And just for the sake of understanding what's going on here in the culture, because obviously we need to frame this the right way to understand what's happening in the culture. If you remember, Corinth is not one in which uh, it's a city that's honoring God in every way, shape, and form, right? They are a culture that is running from it, what's right in, in the regards to morality. They are doing their own thing. Uh, there's a big old hill behind them, mount behind them that is... They're doing sacrifices and all sorts of stuff to false gods. There's um, sexuality that's rampant through their town. It's kind of a highway and byway for a lot of the world and culture. And so there's a lot of, a lot of sin that moves right through Corinth. And, and then now here, and I don't know if you, you've really thought much about this, but Paul's writing to this church in Corinth. And this church is full of baby Christians, and sometimes we read through this and like, seriously, how do you not understand this? Many of us have probably, I would say, most all of us in this room have been Christians longer than this church has been around and any of these people have been Christians. 
So when we read through this book, we're writing to a group of people that have heard or that are hearing the gospel, that are hearing things about God for the first time in, in this way, probably than ever before. This is a baby, a baby church. So, and then also look back in your Bibles. Notice uh, the number that comes before seven is the number six. This is not, not like higher math. <laughs> In chapter 6, you see there, right before chapter 7, uh, this, the context here, because context is important. Culture and context are important when you're reading through the Bible, right? All right, right? Yes. All right, so cool. Culture and context are important. And so culturally, there's a lot of sin going on in this city. There's a lot of people that don't know Jesus. And even in the church that we're writing to, baby Christians, but also context in this letter, right before this, Paul has just been talking about sexual immorality. And we spent, before Easter time, that celebration around the resurrection, we spent time talking about that in chapter 6, because 6 is before 7. Uh, chapter 6, verses 12 through verse 20. And so Paul's just spent a chunk of time talking about pornea or sexual immorality in the life of the church or in the life of Christians. And so then he goes on in the beginning of chapter 7 and says, like, let's talk a little bit more about this. And so look at verse 1 in your Bibles there. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. And so he's, it's stated, it's, it's written there as a, as a statement, but really it's a question. And we don't have this letter that was written to Paul from the church in Corinth, but Paul does. He knows what's going on in their culture because Paul lived in Corinth for a period of time. He knows what's going on. And they clearly seem to have written this letter to him saying, hey, we have some questions. And so in the time here in this chapter seven, uh, Paul's answering their questions about marriage, about sex, about singleness, about celibacy as well. And so that's kind of what we're talking about this week and, and next week. So today, as you see, the gift of marriage. So before we dive into this text, we need to define marriage. Isn't that something that's awesome in this culture? <laughs> Let's define what does marriage look like according to the word of God. So I'm going to say this uh, just up front, like I'm the mailman. I'm not the person who wrote the mail. Okay, I'm just the mailman. And when you don't like the bills in the mail, you don't go beat up the mailman. Okay, so whatever you don't like about what God's word has to say, take it out on God. He can handle it. I'm the mailman. Anyway, God's word says, the mail says, God's letter to us says that marriage is defined as a man and a woman, one of each of those. This is according to the Bible, God's design for marriage, for a lifelong commitment. And this relationship is designed to show the most intimate, emotional, uh, intimate, emotional, spiritual, and physical connection between two people, oneness. And I recently went to a, a marriage conference, actually the end of last year, and there was a speaker there. His name is Trent Griffith, and he was speaking about marriage, obviously, because it's a marriage conference. And uh, he, he says this, and he's also a pastor and has been pastoring, planted a church in, uh, in another state in the country, but he says this about marriage. He says, after many years of teaching, preaching, counseling on God's purpose and plan for marriage, I have a lot to say on the subject. Often, I summarize it all into this sentence. Marriage is a holy covenant initiated by God, conditioned on an irrevocable promise to pursue oneness with an imperfect person of the opposite sex for a lifetime for the glory of God. Whatever else our decaying culture may say, God's definition has never changed. Are you allowing God to define your ideas about what marriage is? God defined it because God designed it. And because he designed it, he gets to define it. As you know, the culture says all sorts of things about marriage. Our job is, as pastors and teachers and preachers of the word of God, is to read the mail. You don't have to like it. God wrote it. Also, remembering in this letter, as we read through this text here, that Paul is writing to a church who's undergoing persecution for their faith. And so as we read through some things here, you're going to see that 
It is Paul hints at that um, as we talk about marriage and as we talk about singleness. And so that's also why he's trying to kind of settle this understanding of what's going on, why are you viewing marriage the way that you are. So look in your Bibles, verses 1 through 5, and then I'll read verse 9 and verse 36. You see that in your outlines. We'll read through those verses together, and we'll talk about uh, some of these points in regards to this gift of marriage. So we understand what marriage is. We could spend really a whole sermon talking about the definition of marriage is and what God has to say about it. Um, today we're talking about specifically four gifts that God has given us in the marriage relationship. And I understand as well that you all are in different places in regards to your marriage relationship. Some of you are divorced. Some of you are single. Some of you are married. Some of you have had hurtful things going on in your marriage. Some of you have a spouse that you're married to that is not walking with God. And some of you have a spouse that maybe is, in quotes, walking with God, but they're not really walking with God, if you know what I mean. They use their mouth. They say these things, but they're not submitting their life to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And so as we look at this, I understand that different people are in different places in their relationships with a spouse um, or a previous spouse or not yet married. And, and next week, we'll talk about singleness as well and what God's word has to say about that. So read with me, starting in verse 1. Now, concerning the matters I wrote to you, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But verse 2, but because of the temptations to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Verse 3, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprave one another, except perhaps, for, uh, perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to what? To prayer. But then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Jump down to verse 9. We'll get through some of these verses we're jumping over. We're going to pick up next week uh, as, we talk about, as we talk about singleness. Look at verse 9. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. And then verse 36 as well, as we look at that, verse 36 says, if anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly towards his betrothed, if his passions are strong and it has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let him marry. It is no, it is no sin. Uh, speaking specifically about this, the first point in your outline is this. A relationship, marriage is a relationship for, and you might put the word healthy in there, healthy or proper or godly sexual expression. And looking at verse 1, as I mentioned, it's not really a statement. It's more a question that they're asking Paul. And Paul knew the context and the culture that was going on in which that question was born out of. Look again at verse, at verse 1. It's good for a man, or is it good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman? And again, remember what just happened. He just wrote about sexual immorality going on in the life of the church. And then their culture, they're looking at that and saying, well, every time we see sex, we see it done wrong. Over and over and over and over again in this culture, it's rampantly done in a way that's not God-honoring. And then Paul just wrote a portion right before this. He says, watch out for that. Be aware. And then he's also saying, and I know that you have some questions about this. And so let me just clarify this. You asked, is it wrong then? Like if, if we just see that sex is, is, they're doing it wrong, maybe we should just avoid it altogether, right? Because they're sinners and not walking with Jesus, and they're having sex in a way that's not God-honoring, so maybe we should just avoid that whole subject altogether. And so they ask this question, so is it good that we just avoid that altogether? Should we just stay away from this? And he's saying, as you see here, no, don't, don't do that. It's good in the, in the, in the context of, of marriage, and really, it's commanded as well. He's saying that it's not good to have sexual relations, as you see in verse 5, if you're married, you should, which is why God said, do this in the context of marriage. But if you're celibate, if you're single, he says, then that shouldn't be a part of your, of your life. Look at verse 2 there in your Bible. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, notice the clarity around this reason. And, and just to note, this is not the only reason to get married, okay? <laughs> I want to be able to have sex in a way that honors God. Oh, well, I guess I'll get married, you look good. <laughs> that's, that's not how you go about picking, picking a spouse. Um, because of quite literally, nevertheless, is what he's saying, to avoid fornication is, was what he's, is what he's saying here. The reason or one reason to get married is to properly practice this gift of sex. One reason, not the reason. Okay, write that down if you need to write that down. <laughs> 
they also live, remember, in a sex-saturated culture where no, matter where no matter where they turn, sexuality is on every street corner. God created us as well to, I, God created this desire inside of us. It's not that the desire for sex is a bad thing, that God's like, you know what? You know, that's just a perversion right there. That's, that's, not, that's not the case. God created this as a good thing to be practiced in the context of marriage. And again, because God designed it, he gets to describe where it's practiced. It's God's design. So in a godly sense, to remain single is to remain celibate and to be, then practice sex in a godly way is then to get married. That's one reason to, to get married. Look in your Bible, though, continuing on. It says, because of your sexual temptation, yes, get married. Each man should have his own wife. And, and I'll just continue to be the messenger here about marriage. Each man that's singular should have his own wife, singular, and it's husband and wife. That's male and female. When we see that the Bible doesn't speak against something, other alternative ways of doing marriage, it seems to be pretty clear here. I don't know about you, but like it seems pretty, quite literally, black and white in my Bible. Uh, Verse, verse 3, the husband should give his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. So you, you see something like this. Again, context is important. Culture and context, right? We talked about that. Context is important. Or culture is important. In the Roman like, world at this time, uh, it's commonplace for people to get married. That was not uncommon for, for marriage to be all over the place. But as some writers even would say, it was not uncommon for some women to tell their age by how frequently they get married and divorced. People were getting married and divorced very, very frequently. Sure, yeah, let's get married. Sounds good. I'm done with you. Let's get a divorce. Let's marry somebody else. We just go on and on and on. And even so, a husband could marry and divorce his wife as quickly as he wanted to for no major reason. There wasn't huge value around this gift of marriage. And even more so, the husband would often use the woman or the wife that he would attain for his own, for his own benefits. I want an heir in my family, so I'll find a woman, I'll get married to her, and that way I have kids by her, and now I have sons. It wasn't I'm marrying this woman because I love her, and I want this to be a God-honoring relationship. Are you with me? And so as we see this, then you look at something like um, verse 4. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And you look at that, and they would have read this and go, yep, we know. I'm the man. I'm the boss. I am the one in charge. And then Paul does this paradigm shift that he just flips everything on its head. And look what he says in verse four, the second part. He says, likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. And then everybody just stops reading. You know, you just imagine that letter gets to this church. Somebody's standing up in front of the church reading that. And they read that and they're like, "Uh uh-huh. Yep. The husband, what? (laughs) Let me, hold on. Let me read that again. This letter from Hold on a second. And, and everyone listening after that's read goes, wait a minute, this is not what we see in our culture in life. We don't see this kind of shift. Back. We don't see this kind of relationship back and forth between the husband and the wife. We see the husband getting to own and to practice his sexual desire with his wife as he pleases and the wife not having a say in that. And even then in the, in the Roman culture, he would often, he could have concubines, he could have prostitutes or whatever. Remember, there's also um, the, the goddess of love, this Aphrodite, you know, there's all of that prostitution going on and the husband can kind of practice that as he, as he wishes. And then he has his wife, and he gets to decide what he wants to do there. Verse 4 is a paradigm shift that was so far outside the culture that they knew. And in this one verse, Paul flips what's normal and politically correct on its head and tells them what God's design for marriage truly looks like. And it's this, and maybe jot this down somewhere. It's a mutual expression of love, surrender, and ownership of your whole self to the other person. It's being willing to say to somebody else, here you go, here's me and all of me, and saying that back and forth to the other person, not saying I own you and you have no say in my life, but rather it's a mu- it, there's a mutuality that goes on there. And that's not common in the culture here. In this verse, Paul tells them that the husband does not have more authority than the wife, and the wife does not have more authority than the husband. Even today, in the midst of Christian view of marriage, even from outsiders and even inside the church, it's, well, I can be the, I'm the husband, I'm the head of the house, right? 
be my, you know, like I'm the, I'm the husband. You better listen to me, woman. Like all of these things quite literally, and we laugh, I'll be serious. Like we laugh, but quite literally this happens in Christian homes today. And this is devastating to the heart of God because that's not how God designed marriage. For the man to say, I'm the boss, you're the person who's supposed to work for me. God loves people, yes. God designed marriage, yes. And you look at even First Ephesians 5, you look at this, this design of husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church, and you see this sacrifice that goes on there. You don't see a lording over and say, listen to me, I'm your boss, but rather I'm here to serve you and to love you. Ephesians 5 speaks about how Jesus gave his life for the church, and so his husband is to give his life for his wife. Verse 5, this verse has been twisted and manipulated. Look at that. Do not deprive one another except for perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again. Why? So that who? Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. This verse has been twisted to manipulate and control for the pur- purpose of personal gain. And, and quite honestly, like this is selfish and it's evil and it's manipulation to say to somebody else, well, the Bible says you have to have sex with me because I'm your spouse. You better do it right now. Like that's, and, and I, like we look at this like, oh yeah, of course, but this this is not something that just happens outside of the life of Christian people. This happens, unfortunately, and sadly, in the life of the church because they're even looking at the Bible and saying, here's my reason for why you should listen to my desire sexually. And again, that's not the point of what's going on here. It's saying, well, because you're married, you have to listen to my desires. Remember mutuality. Remember serving. Remember humility as well. Our relationship with each other should reflect the relationship of Jesus and Jesus' relationship with us, one of surrender, surrender of wills, surrender, surrender of plans, and surrender of our bodies. Sex is something that is good and should be practiced in marriage for the, express, for the expression of unity and for love. It should not be something that is lorded over another spouse for the purpose of manipulation, nor should it be used as a power play so that someone gets something else that they want because of the deep power of that God has given sex, there can also be deep pain surrounding this subject. You know what I'm talking about. There can be deep pain surrounding this. The reason one person shouldn't treat sex like it's theirs to give or to take or to manipulate is because really, as we see here, our bodies, first off, are God's. And secondly, at the altar, we promise them to each other. And so we're striving for oneness with each other. And so when we look to lord over somebody else something that we desire, to put somebody else down, really when our spouse loses, who else loses? We do. Even true in an argument, when we're striving, I have to win this, I have to win this. When the other person loses, you're one with them. You also lose, and so does your marriage. The reason for this is so that Satan doesn't tempt you. The exception for this is when it's agreed upon. There's a lot that can go into this, and we're not going to spend all sorts of time talking about this, but this is something that's powerfully important in the life of the church and something that unfortunately is used and abused even in Christian families and Christian marriages. And I would say that if you're in the midst of struggling with something like this, reach out for help from a godly, wise person that can Look for God to be glorified in your marriage and for both people to be honored. And lastly, for one person to blame the other person, as we see here, some people may be like, oh, let's twist this again, because we have a way sometimes, people in the church, we have a way of using the Bible for our own gain rather than for God's gain in a lot of different places. We can use this even for our own gain, for one person to blame another person for their sexual sin or for their temptation because the other spouse is not giving them sexually what they want is wrong. You can't blame the other person. Well, you didn't give me what I wanted. If you, if you were with me enough, intimately enough, then I wouldn't go out here. You're just blaming the other person for your own sin. And that's dangerous because you could go all over the place with that. That's not what this text exists for. So in short, God designed sex to be expressed in the marriage relationship. When that is done well, underline the word well, you are under the blessing of God in this area. So there you go. Uh, a, a place for 
sexuality be expressed. The second thing here as well, we see this in verses 10 through 11. Look in your Bibles. We jump on a little bit further. Um, it's a relationship. Marriage is a relationship for, a relationship to honor each other. A relationship to honor each other. Look in your Bibles at verse 10 and 11, and then we'll jump down to verses 33 and 34. Verse 10 says this, to the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. And when, when you see that, by the way, it's be, it, when it says not I, but the Lord, it means that the Lord has already given a command or given a charge about this. But when you see sometimes when Paul says, I, not the Lord, he's saying there isn't a previous command about this. So when you, uh, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife, right? So there's a whole sermon right there. Let's talk about divorce. Uh, We're we're not going to right now. Uh, Verse 33, jump a little bit further on here. Uh, But the married man is anxious about the worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please, uh, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. We'll pause, pause there. So This is a relationship. Marriage is a relationship to honor each other, to honor each other. Um, Mark chapter 5, you could jot this down, or actually, I don't know if you knew this, but in your bulletin, when you open that up on the right side, there's a little tab of like weekly reading. Um, there's, There's often verses in there, and those verses are related to the passage that we're talking about on that today. So for example, in there you'll see Mark, I think Mark chapter 5 is in there, um, or Mark chapter 5 verses 31 and 32, and then Matthew chapter 10 verses 1 through 9. Those are two other passages that Jesus talks about marriage in the life of the church. So if you've never noticed that before, weekly reading, more verses about what we're talking about on Sunday morning. So the culture, as I mentioned earlier, divorce is easy, right? I, I'm done with you. Let's move on to the next relationship. I'm going to separate you because, you know, separate from you because I'm, I'm kind of done. And even today, is this very unique? No. I, we were kind of done. It was time. You know, I, it was just, we were ready to move on to the, next, to the next person. Marriage, the reason divorce is becoming more common is because marriage is becoming less sacred. And that's a sad thing. And the reason marriage becomes less sacred is because we're not taking a biblical stance on marriage but rather letting the culture seep into the way that we view this. The, the thing I want to focus on in this is this, a marriage, a relationship to honor each other. We can go on and talk about separation and divorce and all of these other things and remarriage. We're not going to do that today. The purpose of this point is, is this, to honor each other. Look again at verse verse 10 and 11. We're talking about, there's the, verse, the word separation, depending on your version of Bible, divorce. Really, the concept is, is divorce. When is divorce okay? When is separation? When does that need to happen? Um, big, big subjects. Jesus talks a lot about this as well, but the point is this. The reason those things need to happen or happen in the life of people, in the life of the church for Christians is because one or both of those individuals in the relationship stopped honoring each other, they stopped honoring God, and they stopped honoring God's view of marriage. You look at relationships of where where divorce happens, where separation happens, where there's marital problems, somebody or both of them stopped honoring the other person. Just ponder that for a while. They stop looking at marriage and saying, what's God's design for marriage? And that's what I want to do. What's God's view of my wife or of my husband? And that's how I want to live that out. Often, divorce is the result of one or both spouses not honoring the other person and God's design for marriage. The point here is not just of divorce or separation, but that of which is the cause for those things. We could talk for a long time about, is is, is divorce sin? When is that wrong? Why is it appropriate? Here's the thing, church. I I had some conversations even this week. Um, Sometimes in the life of the church and in Christian marriages, we have this view of like, I promised at the altar that I'm never going to leave my spouse. Good, by the way. Uh, I'm going to stay with them forever for life. That's that we're going to see. This is God's design, God's plan for marriage. But here's what can happen is we can focus so much on that part and forget the other part of, I also need to honor and love them the way that God has called me to love them. And so sometimes we can stay, there's, there's couples that are, st- that are in this marriage relationship in which is not honoring to God, 
the way they're treating each other. They're not honoring one another. Yes, they're still together, and maybe nobody else knows that things are falling apart, but the marriage relationship is they're still arguing, they're still yelling, there's still manipulation, there's still anger, there's still all of that going on, but hey, hey, we're still together. Like, wait a minute, hold on a second. That's not practicing the kind of love that God has called us to practice in the life of marriage. That's not honoring each other. And marriage, if marriage is really a gift to the other person for the purpose of honoring them so that you, as a spouse, can grow in holiness, right? Because marriage is more than just about making us happy. It's also about making us holy. I didn't come up with that. Gary Thomas did, uh, another marriage expert guy. Marriage is, is not just about making us happy, but making us holy. And so when life is hard, when marriage is hard, it's not just about, oh, I gotta stay with this person, I gotta stay with this person. That's what you're avoiding. I'm running away from divorce or the con- conversation of divorce rather than running towards, Jesus, help me love this person. Jesus, help me love this person. Jesus, help me be patient with this person, right? 1 Corinthians 13. Jesus, help me be kind to this person. Jesus, help me rejoice with the truth of this person, that my spouse, the person that I married, that I promised to stay with forever. So it's not just a matter of, am I gonna stick it out to the end and we're gonna, we're gonna die, but at least we didn't get a divorce. But God wasn't honored in that. God's heart is that you both, both husband and wife, would honor each other in that. And when good God-honoring relationship happens in the marriage, divorce and separation don't. That's just, you see what I'm saying? Like, that's the byproduct of two people not honoring God, their spouse, and God's design for marriage, a biblical structure of of marriage. I can go on and on about that. I'm not (laughs) going to too much more, but look, in verse 33 and 34, you see this concept as well. Paul, remember I mentioned this earlier, Paul says, that um, there's a lot of, we see this thing in verse 26 in your Bible. I think, it's, I think that's where it is. Um, Paul says, there's a lot of messy things going on in the world right now. I'd advise some of you just don't get married. And here's why. Because there's a lot of persecution going on. And when you do, your attention is, is divided between, I got to keep my wife and my kids safe, and I want to serve the Lord. And going back and forth. By the way, getting married, good God-honoring thing wonderful thing to do, but, but you see in the, in the, what's going on, culture right then, there's a lot of persecution happening, and so Paul says, you know, it might just be easier for you just to stay single, and that means celibate as well, but to stay single, so you're not torn between both of these things. You see this in verse 33 and 34. He says that uh, the husband, if he gets married, he's, he has this tension or this anxiety back and forth between his family and serving God. If you're married, you know what I'm talking about, I want to serve my family. I want to be there for them. And also, I want to serve God. Um, It is, it's under, it's understandable. To honor each other in the marriage relationship is a gift from God and a wonderful opportunity to grow in holiness. And so, church, I'm going to say this to you before we move on to the third point. If God has blessed you with a spouse, honor them. And, and, And maybe there has been excuses in the past for why you haven't. Whatever those are, stop. Get over it because they are God's gift to you, even if they don't feel like a gift. They may feel more like a burden. God has called you to honor them. It doesn't mean that it's easy, but I promise you this, as you walk in that, you will grow in holiness. You will grow and you will grow. And I would encourage you, even if it's in a hard place right now in your marriage, reach out to someone who's trusted for encouragement and support. Don't let that place in your marriage relationship where there's not honor going on, where you're hurting, to be a secret because nothing gets better then. Let the healing happen there. You can read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 33, God's heart for marriage. And you may be wondering, am I honoring my spouse? Ask them. It's a great way to check. Ask your spouse, am I honoring you? Do I honor you in this relationship? Don't nudge anyone next to you, but you can ask them that later. You may be striving and hurting wherever that is. Maybe you need to invite somebody into that, but I would just say this. God has gifted you with somebody else. Honor them. And even when it's hard, work together towards honoring Christ and putting him at the place where you're saying, we're working together to follow Jesus rather than we're just trying to make each other happy because that's not going to work in the long run. Point three is this, a relationship that God can work through. Look in your Bibles in verses 12 through 16. 
Um, such, a, such a powerful and important passage. Uh, look in your Bibles there. Verse 12 starts off and says this, To the rest I say, not I, but the, uh, sorry, I, not the Lord. And that, that is, as I mentioned, that's Paul saying we don't have previous instruction from the Lord. That if a, any brother, Christian that is, has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever, he consents to live with her. She should not divorce him. For an unbelieving husband is made holy because, and the word holy is made holy, is to be sanctified uh, because of his wife. And the unbelieving wife is made holy or sanctified, set apart, experiencing God's blessing because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. That is, uh, but, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife or husband, whether you will save your husband or wife? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? What he's getting at here is there's a few things going on. He's he's kind of answering these questions. So if marriage is good and God wants to be glorified in the marriage as they both, husband and wife, honor God and are obedient to the Lord, what about if one of those people isn't a Christian? What do we do then? Should we get a divorce? Should we stay? Like, what, what should we do? The another question he's kind of, they're kind of asking here, he's answering is this. Is marriage only good if they are of the same faith? But if they aren't, should they just get out because, well, they're both not honoring God or pursuing God together? Or also, is the other person, def- like, am I as a Christian defiled or dirty because my spouse isn't a Christian? Or even, are my kids dirty or defiled because, well, I'm a Christian, but my spouse isn't, so should we just get out of the relationship? Like, what should we do here? And he's answering those questions. He's saying, don't get a divorce. Stay with them if they are open to staying with you. And if they want to leave because of your faith, then so be it. Like, that, that can happen. Uh, you are free, as it says, you are not enslaved if your spouse chooses to say, you know what, I'm done. And this can happen when, let's say, two, un- two, two people are married, one of them becomes a Christian, the other person says, I don't want to sign up for that Jesus thing. I'm leaving. And that happens in some relationships. But something else also happens, and maybe this has happened in your life or in the life of somebody that you know. Sometimes two people are not Christians, one of them gets saved, you see this in verses 14 and 16, and then the other person sees how their life has been changed because of Jesus, and then says, you know what, I also want to follow Jesus. Isn't that a great thing? God can work through the marriage relationship in the spouse, with the spouses. And I, I think there's somebody here, a couple, maybe a couple of you here, that have, I've, you've shared your story there. One of you, both of you are not walking with Jesus. One of you found Jesus. The other person says, I see something that's changed about you. I think I want to try this thing called Jesus too. I want to try Jesus. And wow, he's changed my life as well. God can work through an unbelieving spouse. By the way, this is not a pass for missionary dating or missionary marriage. Like, that's not, I will save them, because they're great. They'd be even better if they're a Christian, so I'll marry them, and then I'll save them, and then whatever else we think. Um, God still says, like, we see this here in Scripture, and the next point we'll say this. When you marry somebody, marry them in the Lord. They need to be someone in the Lord. First Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, this is also a side note in your bulletin, that that, that passage also talks about how one person can be saved because they see your good behavior, your changed life in, in Jesus. If God is able to work through one believing spouse, how much more can he work through two? Amen. When both people are choosing to follow Jesus. And every time a, two parents, God, Bible-believing, God-fearing people have children, they have children that are not heaven-bound. And what that means then is both of them should be working together God working through them, working together to point their children towards Jesus. How much more powerful is it when children get to see mom and dad walking with Jesus? And even when there isn't a mom or the dad walking, it's still saying, wait a minute, God can still work through. So maybe you're the one believer in your family. Maybe you're the believer in your marriage. Your spouse isn't someone who's walking with God. This is also an encouragement to say, keep praying for them because God can work through you. This is the last, last point here. Um, God has given us this, this gift called marriage, yes, for sexual expression, sexual expression, for honoring each other to grow in holiness, for working for his glory, working together for his glory, but also this, for a unique 
lifelong commitment. And that's the fourth point in your outline there. Look at verse 39. It says this, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he, what? Wants to be. No. <laughs> for, as long, for as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry who she wishes, but only in the, in the Lord. Marriage is meant for life. Can somebody say that? Marriage is meant for And God designed it that way. And we know that marriage, there's plenty of marriages that don't exist for life. Though that be God's desire and heart in this. And it's not to say that God looks down and hurt, is, is, looks down and is punishing and all of these other things for someone who is not married for life. That God says, I'm removing my love from you. I'm removing my blessing from you or any of those things. There's obviously places where separation and divorce is the best and only response to a particular marriage relationship. And there's definitely a place to talk about that. God designed marriage in this unique gift for a lifelong commitment. They aren't to leave, but to stay. That's God's design. This is one of the reasons we promise this at the altar. And that's also a reason that you marry someone, not because of their looks, because that could change, but for their personality, for their character, and for their love of Jesus. Because those things, we hope and we pray, continue to be wholesome. God designed and desires this kind of relationship, but it isn't easy. How many of you know that it isn't easy? There are days, some of your hands are going up and your spouse is going, wait a minute, I thought it was easier than that. He's, it's not easy all the time. Some, some relationships, some marriages, they, you know, there are two, three, four, five, six decades in or whatever, and it's been like, this has been the best thing ever. This is wonderful. And others, I talked to a couple yesterday. Uh, they're, third, they were third, they're 31 years into their marriage, and um, uh, their response basically, in short, was, it has been so, so hard every year for, 30, thir- thir- for 31 years. Every year year has just been so toxic and so bad. And the reason for that is, is because for them in this situation, their foundation was super rocky. This is another reason why premarital counseling and thought before marriage matters, because you're not signing up to go through a drive through and to try a burger and be like, I didn't like it. I'll go somewhere else. With a marriage relationship, you're signing, with a marriage relationship, you're signing up and saying, I'm going to do this for life. And so it matters what you do in preparation for that. So I'm going to close with this question. Is your faith affecting your marriage? Is your faith affecting your marriage? Too often, we can put marriage in the, our marriage, our relationship in a corner over here and say, it's okay for me to be angry at my spouse. It's okay for me to treat my spouse like this. It's okay for whatever. And put it in a corner over here and act like nobody knows because nobody really does know. We just look at everybody else. We're still together. We didn't divorce, but we're not honoring God. Is your faith affecting your marriage. And if not, maybe in a particular place that you think it is, look for the places that it's not. Look for the places where, if if I were to invite Jesus into every space of my marriage, where would he say, hey, you gotta work on that? Do that today. Choose today to say, God, this person is a gift for me and I wanna honor you in every space in my marriage relationship. We see that marriage is a gift and next week we'll see that singleness is also a gift. And so I'm going to close now. Next week, we'll talk about singleness. Uh, But I just want to encourage you and challenge you and really uh, point you towards God's heart for this marriage relationship, this gift that God has given you. And if you're alone and you're, you're hurting in that, reach out for help. Don't let that be a secret anymore. Uh, Jesus, thank you that we're able to come before you and know that you love us and that you designed this, this thing called marriage to glorify you to be a representation of your deep love for us and your desire for our relationship with you to be one of oneness and unity and wholeness. I also recognize there's a lot of hurt and a lot of brokenness that can happen around the subject of marriage. And I know that hurts you as your heart as well. So Lord, I pray today for healing where there's hurt, for wholeness where there's brokenness, Lord, and that, that anyone today hurting in this space in their life would come before you, humbly seeking your guidance and your direction for how best to pursue uh, a relationship of marriage that is honoring to you in every, in every way. We thank you for this gift, Lord. We pray that you would help us to uh, honor you with how we interact with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we're going to stand and sing a closing song. If you would like to pray with myself or Pastor Les, we'd love to do that. And then also, if you've maybe said, I'm that spouse that never has surrendered my life to Jesus, 
That's a, today's a great day to do that. Maybe you said, I've never experienced this whole love of Jesus in my life. Um, I wanna experience that today. Maybe your marriage relationship is just hurting and your spouse isn't here or they are here. Um, we would love to pray with you for, that, for God to work and begin that healing process in your life. Let's stand and sing together. You're so good You're 
Jesus, thank you for this incredible opportunity again to come before you, to worship you, because you are so, so, so good. And as we leave today, Lord, help us to remember your goodness because of the gospel, because of your stepping into our world to show us mercy and grace and forgiveness that we did not deserve. Lord, I pray that you would help us to show that to one another. As we celebrate mothers today, Lord, that you would help us to honor them. Thank you for your love for them and even that gift of motherhood in and of itself. Lord, I pray that you would bless every mother here and those that we come into contact with today, Lord, that we would glorify you in our conversations and engagement with them today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You'll have a gift on your way out. Happy Mother's Day, y'all.